Hi, and welcome to lesson or part four of this five part series. We're into the first part of lesson three. There'll be one more part after this, and then we are done. So, uh, just to sort of do a quick recap of uh, what we've been taking a look at, we started by introducing the idea of a complex number. We took this from a historical perspective, looking at uh, efforts made a few hundred years ago to solve the cubic we uh, and how working with this number the square root of negative one seemed to help we then formally defined the imaginary number i use that to introduce the uh, complex numbers and then we use that particular application to find all roots of quadratic equations including the complex ones we then took a geometric look at complex numbers, we looked at the and defined the complex plane. Uh, we did some work interpreting that geometric interpretation and and uh, re looked at it. And now what we're going to do is take a look at some other forms of representing a complex number. And in particular, we're going to take a look at the polar form. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. This will introduce the idea of what's called Euler's formula, which actually gives us another way of writing the polar form. We'll get to, and then we'll look at a particular application of the polar form which will help us out with multiplication and division. So, <clears throat> quick recap with the idea of an imagine, uh, the complex plane. Complex plane, we have a real axis, we have an imaginary axis, and any point on the complex plane defines a unique complex number, uh, which is some number A along the real axis and some number oops, B I along the imaginary axis. And what we did in a, our previous lesson is we defined that as well as a vector, a vector going from the origin to this point ABI. And this vector, of course, defines a bit of a, a right triangle if we drop a perpendicular down to the real axis. And this would be A units along the real axis and B units vertically along the um, imaginary axis and this gives us another way as long as we can define this specific vector in the complex plane um, then that's another way of defining a complex number and another way of defining a vector is not by the coordinates of where its head turns out to be but rather by its magnitude or if you recall its modulus so we can define a modulus r we can define an angle theta, and the modulus and this angle <coughs> measured from the positive real axis defines this vector just as well as the real and imaginary components define that vector. It's nice to be able to convert between the two different types. So for instance, if I already have A and B, then simply the Pythagorean theorem will calculate the modulus R for me. And if I have A and B and I want to calculate the angle, it's the tangent of that angle that relates the B and the A, tangent of course being opposite over adjacent. If I want to go the other way, if I have a, uh, an R and a theta and I would like to figure out what that A is, well again, basic trigonometry is going to help me out. The A is the adjacent side to this particular angle. So I'm going to use cosine and A is going to equal to R times the cosine of theta. And similarly, if I want to figure out what this B is over here, that would be the opposite side to the angle that I have, and B is going to equal to R sine theta. So if I have a value for the A and the B, then I can figure out what the R and the theta is. And conversely, if I have an R and a theta, I can figure out what this A and B is. All right. So let's talk about this polar form, this alternate way. We've been representing a number, <coughs> excuse me, a complex number this way with a real part and then an imaginary part and we simply add those together. So here's a complex number z which is equal to a plus bi where the a and the b could be any real numbers at all. And knowing that a is equal to r cos theta and b is equal to r sine theta, we can simply write this. And all I did was take the a here and replace it with r cos theta right there. And I took the b here and replace that with an r sine theta. So now what I have is a complex number, really the exact same thing, except instead of it being in A and B, which are the real and the imaginary components along the complex plane, they are this r, which is the modulus, or the length of that vector, and theta, which is the angle measured 
in a counterclockwise direction from the positive real axis. We can do a smidge of simplifying. Notice that the r is a um, comp r is a common factor, so we can simply take that out. But that's about it. Now this starts to become a bit of a handful to write. This r cos theta plus i sine theta. The cos theta plus i sine theta is always the same. And when we start writing the same thing all over and over again, we start to come up with little shorthands. And there's a variety of different shorthands. Instead of writing r cosine theta plus i sine theta like this, we could write r arg theta. Arg, A-R-G, standing for the word argument. We'll get to that in just a second. Or another one is to write r angle theta. That's another common notation you might see in some textbooks. Okay, And it's just an abbreviation of writing this. Okay. But this is the one I'm going to use. I'm going to use this one, R and then CIS, which I will always call CIS, um, theta. And the reason why I like this particular notation is because the CIS reminds us of what it really is. The C for the cosine, the I for the I, and S for sine. So it reminds us that when we see CIS, what we really mean is cosine of the angle plus i times the sine of the angle. Um, this new way of representing a complex number we're going to call polar form. Okay, And in general, we're going to give ourselves a little bit of a formula. If you see r cis theta, what it really means is r times the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. One constraint we're going to put on the theta is because we're measuring from the positive x-axis in a counterclockwise direction, our thetas are always going to be between 0 and 2 pi. And just to sort of, because 0 and 2 pi really are the same direction, I'm going to put the equal part here on the 0. So if I mean to be going right along the positive real axis, I'm going to say the angle is 0. And then I'll use no equal to part here, so I won't be saying 2 pi. Our previous way of representing a complex number, this way here, a plus bi, where we use the real and imaginary components, we're now going to call rectangular form. So now we have two forms. We have rectangular form, our old way we were doing before, and we now have this new way, polar form. Okay. <clears throat> Let's practice a little bit about just switching back and forth, just to get comfortable with the formula. So here, for instance, I have some complex number I made up, i plus the root 3i. And I want to express this exact same number, but in polar form rather than rectangular form. Well, it's not that hard to do. I use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the modulus, the r number. So it's just 1 squared plus the square root of 3 squared. And of course, that's going to get me the square root of 4, which is just 2. So my r is a 2. And then I use tangent to figure out what the angle must be, or the what's called the argument the tan of the angle is equal to b over a, so root 3 over 1. That turns out to be one of my special angles. I'm hoping that you are comfortable with the special angles. And uh, if you work that out, that comes out to be pi over 3. Now, you do have to be a little careful. I'll do another example where I'll illustrate just how careful you do need to be. Is um, Let me sort of draw it over. Get rid of that highlight, but I'll draw it over here. Is You do have to sort of picture this a little bit. Because sometimes your calculator can give you the wrong answer. So I'll show you what I mean. So for instance here, draw myself a real axis or imaginary axis and I'll draw myself a... Why is that not drawing? There we go. A uh, real axis there. And one, one along the real and root three along the i would be some point... I don't know, over here somewhere. It doesn't exactly matter. But it's clearly in the first quadrant. That would be my vector right there. So my angle, my argument, right there, is clearly between 0 and pi over 2. Pi over 3 is in that same quadrant, so that is the angle that I want. I'll do another example where the angle isn't going to necessarily be the one that your calculator is going to give you. So you do have to be a little bit careful. How am I going to go about erasing all this stuff? Here we go. Yeah. Let's do another example. Okay, so thus z is 2 cis pi over 3. I'll erase to it. Okay. 
Uh, what about z equals i? Now, if I wanted to, I could get into all my little formulas, but for some of these ones, the ones that are pure real or pure imaginary, it's actually much, much easier to simply picture what's going on. I'll show you what I mean. If I picture z is equal to i, if I picture i in the complex plane, so again, here's my imaginary axis like this. Here's my real axis right here. Uh, I is right there, right? It's on the imaginary axis. There's no real component, so it would be I along the imaginary axis just up to that. Well, what would my R and my theta be? Well, the magnitude of that vector is 1. It's simply 1 unit up the imaginary axis. And my angle from the positive real axis would just be pi over 2. So instead of getting into my formulas, I can just simply picture that. Oh, that would be 1 cis pi over 2. And that's all it is. So look for these ones, you know, that are pure real or pure imaginary. Instead of, um, instead of using your formula, simply picture it and then simply state it. So here the real component would be 0 and is positive 1 i on the imaginary axis as such the modulus would be 1 and the argument would be pi over 2 so this number would be right there 1 cis pi over 2 and I didn't put the 1 down because I didn't need to. Alright, one more. Before I go any further, just erase this. Okay. Z is equal to negative 2 and negative 8i. Let's write that in polar form. So let's go through it. Our part's easy. Again, it's just a Pythagorean theorem. So negative 2 squared plus negative 8 squared. That's square root of 20. I can reduce that because 20 is 4 root 5. The square root of 4 is 2. So it's 2 root 5. Boom, done. Okay. Here's where I got to be a little careful. The tan of the angle, so I go B over A. B is negative 8. A is negative 2. So I get tan of the angle, tan of the argument is equal to 4. But I got to watch out. Because if I drew this, let me draw this right here. Again, there's my imaginary axis. There's my real axis. Negative 2, negative 8i is some point down here in this quadrant. It's negative on the real axis, negative on the imaginary axis. There's my vector going down there. And my argument, my angle, is that guy. Clearly, my angle is in the third quadrant. Okay. However, if I just took my calculator and just did, you know what I'll do? I'll bring up my calculator here. I should have had this set up beforehand, so if you just excuse me for a second. Bring up a calculator here, and I'll have to make sure that I am in, put it over here. Make sure I am in radian mode, which I am. Good. And if I just go second function or inverse tan of 4, my calculator says about 1.3. But that's not the right answer. Okay? My calculator, because it doesn't know what's going on with this particular problem, is giving me the answer that's over here in the first quadrant because it just sees tangent as positive and so it's giving me this angle but that's not the one I want. What I want is the angle that gets me over to the third quadrant. So how do I go about getting that? Well, it's, it's not so hard. So the first thing to recognize is whenever you use the inverse tan function on your calculator, your answer is always going to be between negative two, or sorry, negative pi over two and positive pi over two. Your calculator will not give you answers in this quadrant here. So if you see from the information that's given that you are in either the third or the second quadrant, then you gotta go, okay, wait a minute, I want the answer that's between pi and three pi over two. That's what puts it over here. So how do I go about doing that? Well, what I recognize is, is this number that's given by the calculator is, let me get it here, is right, is this angle right here, this 1.3, I won't put it in the other decimal, it's that angle there. So I got to sort of picture it. Oh, that's that. That's 1.3 right there, radians. So the angle I want is pi radians plus 1.33 more. So that is what I do with my, just do it. So my angle I want is pi plus 1.33, which is about 4.47.
So that is my my number. And I had to approximate because I didn't pick a number that came out to be a special angle. So Z is about 2 root 5 cis 4.47 radians. Okay, so be on the lookout for that. Very easy mistake. All right, moving on. Okay, let's go the other way. This is actually really easy. What if I had a number in polar form and I wanted to go into rectangular form? All I have to remember is what the cis means. Cis stands for the cosine of the argument plus i times the sine of the argument. So, if I want to if I want to figure out this in rectangular form, 2 root 3 cis pi over 6 is 2 root 3 cosine 5 pi over 6 plus i sine pi over 6. And I'm going to assume your work with radian measure and special angles and all that stuff is pretty good, that you can work out that the cosine of 5 pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, and that the sine of 5 pi over 6 is negative a half. I simply then multiply the 2 root 3 in. Notice that the 2's in the denominators are going to divide out with the 2 here in the root 3. So I'm just going to get 3 minus root 3 i. There it is in rectangular form. Pretty easy. Okay, we'll do another one. What about 5 cis pi? Now, let's do it just kind of mechanically, but you might notice something about this one. But uh, let's do it mechanically first. First of all, I can sit there and I go, oh, okay, well, again, cis is cosine of the argument plus i sine of the argument. So 5 times the cosine of pi plus i sine pi. And the cosine of pi is negative 1. I'm assuming you don't have a problem with that. Sine of pi is 0. And if you work that out, that comes out to be negative 5. But we could have done that without getting into any kind of calculating if we wanted to. If we just pictured it, we'll draw it over here. Again, real or imaginary and real axes. If my argument is pi, see that right there, well, pi radians puts me right over here onto the negative part of the real axis. And then if I go out five units in that direction, well, that's simply going to get me a point that's at negative 5 on the real axis. So 5 says pi is simply negative 5. Okay, and that's it. So you can do a lot of these by picturing them if they come out to be pure real or pure imaginary ones like this one. Okay, Euler's formula is a bit of a diversion. Leonard Euler, 18th century, great mathematician at the time, came up with a formula that gives us actually another way of representing polar complex numbers. Okay, and I'm going to first give it out, and then I'm going to go through a bit of a proof. And to be honest, Euler's formula is pretty remarkable just on itself, and there's some exercises that really try and bring home just how remarkable this is. But if I take the number e and raise it to the i pi, right here, e to the i pi, where i is our imaginary number square root of negative 1, that that's the same thing as the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. Okay, That is by no stretch of the imagination obvious or intuitive or anything like that. In fact, upon first seeing it, most people react and go, well, what? why? Why would e to the something be the same as the cosine plus the i times the sine of that something. Well, it turns out that it is. And I'm going to go through a bit of a proof and show you that it is. Well, sort of. Because these are based upon what's called the McLaren series expansions for e to the x, sine of the x, and cosine of the x. And proving these formulae is well beyond the scope of this particular lesson. You have to get quite a ways into calculus to see these. So, for instance, it turns out that the cosine of any particular angle in radians. Okay, So if I wanted to take the cosine, say, of 2 radians, I can calculate that by going 1, and then minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. And if you've not seen this notation before, this factorial notation, I'll just explain it very quickly. But 2 factorial, that's what the exclamation mark means. 2 times, that means 2 times 1, which of course is just 2. But then 4 with an exclamation mark after it, or 4 factorial, means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay? And if you work that out, that comes out to be 24. Okay. Well, a pretty big number. And 6 factorial, 
you might be starting to guess, is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you always start with whatever number is before the exclamation mark and then times one less than that, one less than that, and keep going until you get down to 1. And if you work that out, what's that going to be? It's like 720, I think. Yeah. Okay. So a pretty big number. You know, one thing you notice about factorials is they get big very, very quickly. Okay. Just get rid of this stuff. Okay. So it turns out that if I wanted to take the cosine, say, of two radians, I can go on my calculator and go 1 minus 2 squared over 2 factorial, which remember is just 2. And then add 2 to the exponent 4 divided by 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. And then subtract 2 to the power of 6 divided by 6 factorial, which is about 720. And then I would keep going with this pattern. The next one would be... 2 to the 8 over 8 factorial, then minus 2 to the 10 over 10 factorial. And I keep going, and as I keep going, I will get my answer to a greater and greater accuracy. And this is an infinite series. It keeps going. It doesn't end. But pretty soon, because the factorials get so large so quickly, pretty soon you're going to be adding and subtracting very, very small numbers. So you'll get this very quickly to a very high degree of accuracy. Quite a remarkable series. I'm not going to prove it. You have to do quite a bit of calculus to prove it. Okay. But if you want to, you can get out in your calculator and try it out. Go cosine of 2. See what the decimal is. Again, make sure you're in radians. And then try 1 minus 2 squared over 2 factorial plus 2 to the 4 over 4 factorial minus 2 to the 6 over 6 factorial. If you want to keep going, you can. Press equals, and you'll find that those two decimals are remarkably close to each other. And the more you go along with this particular series, the pattern, the closer they'll become. Okay. And in fact, this calculation is in fact what your calculator is doing in order to work out what the cosine of 2 is. It's, it's these kind of calculations right here. Okay. And there's a similar McLaren series for sine, except instead of working with even exponents and even numbers under the factorials, they're odd numbers. Pretty amazing. Sine of any angle is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus 5 to the 5th over 5 factorial minus 7 to the, or x to the 7 over 7 factorial, and then keep going on with that pattern. Okay. And there's a similar series that works out e to any particular number. e to the x, where x can be any real number you want, will always equal x and then plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 3 over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial, on and on and on. The further you go with this, the more accurate it becomes. Again, I'm not going to prove it. I'll leave that for some future calculus course that you might be able to take. But armed with these, we can then prove our Euler's formula that we had on the previous slide. So let's go through and do that. So if we take our cos theta plus i sine theta, I can replace the cosine theta with the expansion for cosine theta. And I can replace the sine theta with the McLaren expansion for sine theta. And then on the next slide, I'm simply going to multiply the i into the second bracket. And then I also rearrange the terms a little bit. So I have 1, which is this one here. And then I have i times theta, which is right there. And then I have negative theta squared over 2 factorial, which is right there. And then I have i times negative theta cubed over 3 factorial, which is right there. And I kept going with this, and I ordered this in, in increasing orders of powers on the theta. Okay, That's all it is. And this, again, of course, would keep going on into infinity. Here's the clever part in the next one, so I might spend a little bit of time explaining this, okay? Uh, this line here is equivalent to the one above it. Here, I'll show you. Well, first of all, 1's 1. That's easy. And i theta. Here's i theta again. I just put brackets around it to group it. Here I changed theta squared, or more particularly negative theta squared, to plus i theta squared. This is still right. And the reason is, is because if I take i and I square it, i times i, i squared, and i squared is negative 1, and that would put the, just put a negative out in front of this. So if I take that and expand out the square, I will get this. 
And similarly, if I take i theta cubed and expand that out, I will get this. Because i to the power of 3 is the same as i squared times an i. The i squared is a negative 1, so that would be the same as negative i, and that's where this negative i comes from. i to the power of 4 is equivalent to 1, because i to the power of 4 is i squared squared. i squared is a negative 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. So i, I theta to the 4 is the same as just theta to the 4. And I can keep going with this. Always in the brackets is this i theta. But if you take a look at this expansion, this is the expansion for e to the x, except instead of an x, it's an i theta. So this is equivalent to that. Okay, so that's the end of the proof. And you don't have to memorize the proof per se. Um, but uh, in the end, you just have to know that cosine theta plus i sine theta is equivalent to e to the i theta. Okay. So this gives us a third way of representing complex numbers. We're going to call that exponential form, but in a way it's really still just polar form. It's just polar form written in a different way because it's still an r and a theta, a modulus and an argument. So for instance, if I have z is equal to 3 cis pi by 3, and I want to write it in this exponential form, it's the same thing as 3e to the pi over 3i. The 3 stays at the front, you have an e instead of a cis, and then you have whatever the argument is, pi over 3 times i. That's equivalent. These two things are different ways of writing the exact same thing. So it's pretty easy to switch between exponential form and this polar form, this cis form. All right. So what? Why have this other form? We were working fine with our complex numbers before this. Why bother with this polar form? Well, it's going to help us out with some operations. Okay. First, so let's start looking at the operations that we've previously done with our complex numbers. We are looking at adding and subtracting. Well, it turns out adding and subtracting in polar form is quite the pain. I, you could develop a formula if you like. I'll leave it to you if you want to do that. But to be honest, if you had two numbers in polar form and you were going to add them, the easier thing to do is to convert them to rectangular form like we were doing earlier in this lesson, add the real components, add the imaginary components, and then convert back to polar form. Okay, I'm not going to do that. You can do that if you wanted to. However, for multiplying, it turns out that polar numbers really help us. And this is why I introduced this exponential form, because the way in which we're going to combine these becomes really obvious. You actually already know how to do it. So let's say I have two complex numbers, r1 e to the i theta 1, and r2, or z2 equals r2 e to the i theta 2, where r1, where the r's and the thetas can be any real numbers that we want them to be. Okay. I'm going to multiply them together. Well, let's take a look at what I got here. I have two powers. Well, first of all, I have the r1 and the r2, and those are just real numbers at the front of each of the powers. I can just multiply those two together, r1 times r2, boom, done. But the e powers, well, we have, we have rules for that. If we multiply two powers and their bases are the same, and here both bases are e's, and they always will be e's, I simply add the exponents. This is a power rule I've known for a long, long time. So if I wanted to simplify it, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to go r1 times r2, multiply that, see what I get, and then I'm going to add the two arguments together and get that. I suppose I could take the i out as a common factor at the top, simplify that a little bit, but I get this. So it turns out that if my numbers are in polar form and I were to multiply them, instead of doing the uh, distributive property that I had to use before, all I simply do is take the two moduli, multiply them together, and take the two arguments, the theta 1 and the theta 2, and add those together. And it's done. So let's put that into form of a couple of rules, right? Right off the bat, here are the rules. If I have two numbers in polar form, I simply multiply the two moduli together, add the two arguments together, and that is my result. Um, when I multiply them, I'm done. It's that simple. Okay. It immediately follows after this that if you were dividing two polar numbers, two complex numbers in polar form, you're going to divide the two r's and you're going to subtract the two thetas. You can go through that little proof if you want to, but it follows exactly what I had in the previous slide, except 
instead of multiplying, just divide them. I guess the one thing we have to put in here is that the R2 still can't be a zero. We still are not allowed to divide by zero. So the um, thing you're dividing by can't be zero. That's all. Okay. Otherwise, you can divide any two complex numbers that you want. Okay. So we'll go a quick example here. Okay, let's evaluate each. And I want my arguments, now that we're going to be changing some arguments because we're going to be adding and subtracting angles together, I want to make sure that my angle always stays between 0 and 2 pi. I'll show you an example of that in just a bit. So here we go. We've got two things we're going to multiply. We're multiplying these two things in polar form. So how do we go about doing it? Well, it's pretty easy, really. You just multiply the two r's together, so 3 times 2, which is obviously just going to give me 6. And then I add the arguments together. So I'm going to get pi by 4 plus pi by 2. And I just do it. There we go. 3 times 2 is 6. Pi by 4 plus pi by 2 is 3 pi by 4. There's the result. I'm going to take a look at my angle. Is that still within the range I want my angles to be? Yeah, it is. 3 pi by 4 is, well, it's less than pi, so it certainly is less than 2 pi. So there we go. We're done. That's it. Nice and easy. It's very easy to multiply and divide these things. How about dividing? Well, here are two polar numbers. I'm going to divide them. How do I go about doing that? Well, again, easy peasy. You divide. The two moduli, 3 divided by 2 is just going to be 3 halves. And then you subtract the two arguments, pi by 4 minus pi by 2. And that's going to get me 3 halves, cis, negative pi by 4. OK, now negative pi by 4 is outside of my range here. OK, so what can I do to fix that? Actually, it's pretty simple. Many of you probably are already seeing exactly what you can do to fix it. But just to make sure everybody sees what it is that you can do to fix this, let's just sort of draw. I'm going to draw this guy, this result. What does that look like right, on my complex plane? Well, let's see here. Here we go. That's my real axis. This is my imaginary axis. So my angle is negative pi by 4. So pi by 4 in a negative direction would be in that direction. There is my complex number right there. This modulus or right here would be 3 halves. So it would be 3 halves units along this way. Get me a point right here on the complex plane. So there's where it is. Except I don't want to use this angle of negative pi by 4. I want to use the angle that's between 0 and 2 pi, which would be that guy. Well, how do I get that? Well. Most people recognize pretty quickly that all I have to do is realize, well, a complete revolution to here would be 2 pi. So I just got to take 2 pi, subtract off the pi by 4, and that's all I got to do. And that's all I am going to do. So I take the negative pi by 4, I add 2 pi. The best way to just think about it is this. You don't have to picture it every single time. If you add or subtract 2 pi's, adding or subtracting 2 pi's to a low, uh to a vector in polar form, do it right here. Like if I took this vector and I simply added a 2 pi or subtracted a 2 pi, that just is a complete revolution. That just gets me right back to where I started from again. So you're free to add or subtract 2 pi's to any argument to your heart's content. So if you see that the argument that you get is outside of the range from 0 to 2 pi, simply add or subtract 2 pi's to get it back into the range that you want. And just add as many 2 pi's or subtract as many 2 pi's as you need to. In this case, we just have to add 1 2 pi. And negative pi by 4 plus 2 pi will get me 7 pi by 4. And there it is. Now it's, now it's the way we want it. So there's our polar form number that we get when we divide these two guys here. All right, that's it. We have one more set of operations to take a look at, and then some applications, and that was what's going to happen in the uh, next part. But for now, you now have the tools that you need to go into the third and final problem set and try some of these problems. One to four, really just practicing working with converting between rectangular form and polar form and exponential form, I suppose. And question seven, actually, I really like question seven, kind of gets into some really uh, neat things that uh, you may or may not have been aware of but I'll leave it for you to play with and discover. All right, that's it. We'll see you.